Again, uh, good afternoon and welcome to the lab. This is lab two for you guys. Uh, lab two deals with wave phenomena. And uh, the lab two, the instructions of the lab, they're actually on Canvas. And let me pull this window out of all of the other windows so that you guys see basically what I'm looking at. Because I cannot use the simulation of the student, because if I do it, it will tell me that as a student, I need to uh, complete the previous uh, stuff. So let me share with you the screen. What is uh, not unique, but actually different than the last lab, because last time, for some reason, the rubric was not available immediately. So we couldn't go through it, but actually after the lab, I sent in message, I think within 15 minutes or something, because I uploaded the, uh, the rubric there. So I wanted your attention to it too then for the previous lab, for lab one, so that you guys are aware of this rubric and how it works, okay? You may use it as a check mark, basically, for your, before submitting your lab reports, you would want to, uh, to go through it to make sure that you're not missing anything, okay? Because it tells you here how everything is graded for full credit or partial credit, everything, all of the, the items in the lab. For this one, this lab is out of 57 points, if you look at the bottom, okay? If you fulfill all of the requirements, that's how much you will get. This lab is basically a survey of uh, waves. That's why it's what is called wave phenomena. And since we're doing waves, so it's in a sense, it's a little bit of a light activity reversal compared to what we're doing in lecture in terms of stuff, uh, in terms of basically concepts. So this is just a survey. You go through a bunch of links and you answer the questions. There are a total of 24 questions, okay? And uh, you go through, it tells you, okay, go through this link and basically click on it. You're clicking on it and then you answer the question and so on and so forth. As I mentioned in the lecture, some of these ideas in this lab will be further explored in other labs down the road, okay? So this is not uh, basically uh, uh, everything in here. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not in depth. That's the word they should uh, use. This is more of a survey of wave phenomenon that's basically looking at them globally. Now, don't forget your name or the name of the people who work with you and the lab report that's critical. Do not, usually it's a good idea to leave the objective toward the end, just so that at least you know what's going on, what you did, the concepts that you have explored, okay? Uh, I know we're talking about wave phenomenon, this explores waves, so you have to give a little bit more of what is a wave and what are you exploring in a wave, okay? So basically uh, all of the things that you try to identify in the wave. So do not leave it as general as possible. Do not make it too specific. The objective needs to be no more than a paragraph in length, but cannot be a brief abstract thing that doesn't really cover uh, basically what you're talking about, what you're doing in the lab. So it has to be somewhere in between. And in here, the rubric says that it needs to at least, uh, sorry, it doesn't say that, but it's probably a good idea, two sentences, at least two sentences. So, let me fix that quickly in here because that's at least two. So why is my cursor not working now? At least two complete sentences, okay? Doesn't mean it has to be exactly two complete sentences, but the point in here, you guys got it, okay? So let me update it. And the conclusion, since I'm here, let me make sure this at least three sentences, okay? The conclusion is more in depth. So let me fix that quickly. At least three complete sentences connecting to the objective and goals of this lab and comparing the results, including data to support statements must be, oh, here, sorry. 
So there is no need for this change in here. So this is fine. So I'm going to cancel because at the end it's selling you. Does that one say too? Maybe I didn't read the last part of the objective. No, it doesn't say. So in here, at least two sentences, the other one at least three sentences. And please, so let's update it anyway. Okay. And uh, that is in a nutshell what this grading is. So all the questions are similar in the sense that complete sentences, correctness plus proper use of scientific terms and units. Okay. So if there is a measurement and there will be measurements in this lab where you're going to find wavelength and things like that. So you're going to use that, uh, the units in there, okay? So again, this is basically things that you to watch for, for all the, all the questions are graded the same in similar fashion. This lab does not really have table, does not have data. So don't worry about that for right now, but down the road, you might encounter that. So you're going to have that they're graded differently. In other words, what I'm trying to say in here is watch for this rubric, okay? It is critical that you guys follow it, okay? Because I follow it in grading. I'm going through it, okay? So you too, while you're preparing your lab report, go through it. There was a question, I don't think it's from your class, from another class, and they said that, let me open this PDF file. If you click on it again, oh man, it's opened in uh, the browser. I'm gonna download it in here and open it with Adobe, okay? And once it opens with Adobe, I'm gonna share that file with you guys. Okay, so this is opened in Adobe. Let me stop sharing that screen and share with you how it looks like. Share the screen. Are you guys looking at a PDF file that says lab 02 wave waves phenomena. That's wrong. That should not be that. Okay. So this should be say wave phenomena. Okay. Are you looking at the same thing? Yes, no, maybe. I can't see the chat now since I have the share file. Can somebody confirm? Harris, can you confirm it? Yeah. OK, very good. Thank you. So I just wanted to make sure, because sometimes I'm talking about something and I go very much in depth. And then at the end, people tell me, hey, we're not seeing what you're seeing. So again, anytime you see a red thing in here, that is a required field, okay? You might have problems saving this file if you don't put something in that. This one will be your name and that of everybody who worked with you in this lab. Now, uh, it is a good idea to start with it first, okay? Go back to the rubric and you see that this is too graded, okay? The objective, as I said before, it's probably a good idea to leave it toward the end, but don't forget it, okay? Because it's uh, it's it's important to to have your objective. Otherwise, you lose valuable points in here. You have to know what you're doing. Now, since it's red, it's required. So it's a great idea to put some text in there to do, for example, okay? So when you put to do, at least you know what you're supposed to do next, okay? Do not send it with a to do statement saying that you're going to do that, okay? But come back to it and make sure it's completed. So the first question in here, it gives you basically of how this, basically a picture of some sort of a wave. So you have Y and you have X in here. So this is a wave frozen in time. And it gives you several points on the wave in here, A, B, C, D, and E, and F, and G, and H. And it gives you some sort of a scale in here on the X axis in terms of meters. So uh, this, because this is a, uh, uh, spatial behavior. So these units are in meters from here, from the beginning to here, it's one meter. Half a meter later, so it's one and a half meters altogether. From now, the y-axis has arbitrary units because it really is uh, doesn't matter what it is. It could be pressure in Pascal. It could be density in kilograms per cubic meter. It could be displacement for a string, for example, and in meters, it could be an electric field, as a matter of fact, in uh, newtons per coulomb, it could be a magnetic field, it could be any wave that you can think of, okay? This is its intensity, 
or it's actually it's a magnitude okay as it changes it's it's a its value as it changing with space from location to location to location so this is a typical wave okay and in this consider that which pairs of letters in the illustration above could be used to calculate the wavelength and what is the value of the wavelength so if you look at this pair in here remember the wavelength is uh, the distance between and it's in meters actually between uh, two similar points there is a pair already ci which are identical in this case because crest to crest i don't see a trough in here so i see only f so i cannot use the letter f so ci will do the letters b and h also could be used i cannot use the letter d in here to find this one in here okay but b i'm going up the wave is still like uh, rising toward the crest in D, we're coming from the crest, so I cannot use this point, but I can use the point H. This distance is also wavelength. If I am answering that, those are the two points that I, the, the pair C and I, B and H, and if you look close, you're going to find at least one more pair. Do you guys see it? Does anybody see the other pair of numbers? Third one. I already said C and I and B and H. Do you see another two letters that I can combine to find the wavelength? Any suggestions? A and G. I'm sorry? You can use A and G. Do you guys agree? A and G also is the same state. Both of them is the wave is zero. And this one is we're coming from a negative going to the positive. We're going from the negative to the positive. So this is correct. Whereas E is not good because E is going from positive to negative. That is not the same state. So this is actually a wavelength also. Does this make sense? So those are all of the pairs, basically. And this, at least, and the letters that are given. Which one is easier to actually calculate the wavelength of these three pairs? That does not require any kind of extrapolation. The distance between the points. Which one is the easiest distance to find? I'd say B and H. Okay, B and H. And that distance is exactly how much? How many meters? One meter. So we answered the question. Thank you very much. So basically B and H, because one and quarter meter minus quarter meter, that distance is one meter. So we know the wavelength. And this distance must be true also between A and G and must be true between C and I. As a matter of fact, this point in here that is not named is the same thing as this point that is not named. This point that is not named is the same as this point that is not named. So any points that you like and there, the distance between them is one meter. So we answered this question. So if you do that, don't forget the unit and you're in business, okay? That's it, you are actually in very good shape in here, okay? Don't forget about, I mean, don't, it's okay for the sig pigs in here because these numbers look like uh, the, the weakest link in here is one. So this one sig fix. So if you say one, it's good enough. So don't worry about 1.0 or 1.00 because these are known values in here, it looks like. Okay. And this is a hypothetical wave. This is not uh, something that uh, it's just to help you basically. I say. Which pairs of elicitors could be used to calculate the amplitude now? The amplitude is defined as the maximum displacement. So which pairs do you think we can use for the amplitude in here? The distance between them. I'm going to find one pair, and then I will let you know to find the others. The distance between A and C, this vertical distance, is an amplitude. You guys see that? Yes? Good. Does this make sense? Or maybe the vertical amplitude distance between A and C is an amplitude. Justin, were you trying to say something? 
Oh uh, yeah, it does make sense. Okay, so about E and C, it's the same thing. G and C, all of these are vertical distances. A and I is a vertical distance. E and I is a vertical distance, and G and I a vertical distance. Don't forget that G and F, E and F, and A and F, all of this distance between these points is the same thing, as long as you're looking at the vertical distance. So that basically the, we, we answered the second question too, okay? Now, you have a wave that was located in here, and now it has moved, as you can clearly see. So this is a temporal behavior now, okay? So the second one is the point A before, and now it has shifted. So it has moved. So again, this is definition of the frequency, the dispersion law that we saw in lecture. And you're given now, suppose that basically lambda is 1.2 meters and the period is 0.4 seconds. So the frequency in this case is going to be 1 over 0.4 or 2.5 hertz. The wave speed can be calculated using that formula since now we know what lambda is and know what f is. So we can plug the numbers or so use the first one with the lambda over t, whichever way you are comfortable with, it's going to turn out to be three meters per second. This stuff is supposed to be easy at this point. And it's all of this entire lab is really of this type. So I don't expect to have a lot of complicated calculations. You're given lambda, you're given t, now you're supposed to follow this example and find the velocity v. Is this lab easy enough for you guys, for you guys to do? I think it is. Now here is the part where you're going to identify. So the first part in how far, how are the wavelength and period of frequency related uh, to the wave is the amplitude of the wave entered in this. So now the amplitude, you don't see it anywhere. So the second part of it. So you're supposed to answer this question in the next two questions. Now here is where the part comes in into play as comparison to the lecture. And I was referring it to, uh, to it in the lecture. You're supposed to watch this video and that describes transverse wave. This, watch this video, and that describes a longitudinal wave. I call this also compressional wave, which is the same thing. Okay. And you're supposed to answer these questions and how they are basically. That's the red dot. So you're going to watch the red dot, and you're going to answer that. So answering question five really relies on you watching these two videos. Okay. Same thing. This we saw in lecture, the power is proportional mainly to the square of the amplitude and the velocity. There are more terms in it actually that we found. So this symbol is proportional. So there are more terms we found in the lecture, but that's basically, this is in general, not true for us for the string. This is true all the time. So the answer that we found earlier in the day was actually for the string, okay? So the general E squared, the square of the amplitude of oscillations is going to be there and the velocity with which it propagates, that is the how far the energy is carried with the velocity v. So that is, if you wish, a wave. A wave does not involve transport of material, and you will see that through the uh, dot. Dot will go back and forth, back and forth, but doesn't go from end to end, okay? It stays in its local area. But what is transmitted in this case is energy via this expression by the power, and what the rate at which is actually this velocity v. So hopefully that what explains that. Water waves are combination of the two. Again, you're going to watch that, and it has the back and forth motion that's similar to trans, uh, uh, compression wave or longitudinal wave, but also it has an up and down motion too, okay? Transverse to, uh, similar to transverse waves. So again, you're going to watch the link, and you're going to watch for torsional waves, basically, okay? That you twist, and then it's going to propagate. And uh, there is another one in here that has to do with circular waves, okay? And uh, you're going to watch this one and answer question six. And here it talks about quantum waves, and it gives you a bunch of uh, videos, OK? And uh, actually a link to a JGebra uh, animation that I built, uh, I think, last year or something, uh, for quantum waves, OK? Although they are waves called waves, but if you take 4D, you will know that actually there is nothing waving, OK? These are mathematical waves. They are not real. Uh, so the wave function that people talk about it in this case is not something waving. It's really a mathematical complex number, OK? So that is the bottom line in here for question seven. So not everything that is called a wave is a wave. 
Now, wave phenomena, they exhibit some basic behavior, the law of reflection, basically that says the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of refract uh, reflection. Uh, again, this one, like I said before, is just an exploration of the idea and that's how image is formed actually. So if you're standing in here and looking at an object that is there, you look through the mirror and you see its reflection. For you, it appears that the object is on the other side of the mirror, that's all, okay? And the law of this reflection, have you guys done uh, optics before in, college, in high school maybe or something? Yes or no? Did any one of you do it? I don't think I have. Okay. It's fine. I mean, it's a basic law. This is how the images are formed. Let me share the screen again. So this is an anticipation of something that we will be doing down the road a long, long time from today. Okay. But probably we'll come back to this one. And again, it's an experiment in here. Okay, I can't use the, it doesn't translate to the other screen. Man, I hate this. So let me move this to this screen. Okay, so let me stop sharing the screen and move it to the other screen. Where is it? I lost it. Lab. Okay. and share screen. So this is how the image forms basically from an object. So again, can I draw in here or not? No, I can't. It's complicated, this thing in here. See, you stop sharing the screen again and give you my preferred way of doing business, which is on OneNote. This is not really optics per se, but we're going to be doing this down the road. So it's a good idea to introduce the idea if you didn't see it in high school. So think about this one as your introduction to it in high school. So again, the, our law of reflection. So here is a mirror. And you're standing in front of it. This is the best rendition I could make of somebody standing in front of the mirror, okay? <laughs> so you look at your feet in here, your feet on this side. So what you do in this case, you look in here and this is how you get the reflection. So the light comes in from the feet, hits the mirror and bounces off so that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. This is the angle of incidence theta i and this is the angle of reflection theta r. Now for you, since you're looking straight to the mirror, you're not looking at your feet, it looks like this is where your foot is located, okay? So that this distance is equal to that distance and you swear that that's actually where your foot is on the other side of the mirror. As a matter of fact, if you look at your hand, for example, your hand looks like it's coming from, again, it obeys the same law of uh, in incidence and reflection. So your hand looks as if it's in here. As a matter of fact, if you look at the other hand, it's gonna be here. For you, it looks like it's coming from the other side. And if you keep on this, it looks like there is another you on the other side who's standing with his, uh, all of a sudden his head is bigger now, it should be less. And his foot this one is longer. Hopefully you guys realize that the other side has an exact replica of you. If you keep on looking from top to bottom, just keep on looking in the mirror, you will see another person on the other side who looks exactly like you. And if you raise your hand, that person would raise his hand. Obviously, there is no person on the other side of the mirror. You guys know that, don't you? Obviously, there know. isn't. <laughs> okay, good. I'm glad that Justin agrees with me that there's no person on the other side. It's just a reflection, okay? So this is the law of reflection. So the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And this is how the image is formed. Image formation. And image formation is going to be a big topic down the road when we do optics, okay? It relies on this idea, okay? Obviously, a flat mirror is kind of easy, but when the mirror is curved, convex or concave, then you're talking about complicated geometries. If you have now a lens, that's a different story altogether. For a lens, which is used in cameras and used everywhere else, 
then you have a different story. And the story there is the law of refraction. A refraction. So you have a medium in here, water, for example, or a thick glass or something like that. Okay. And you have a different medium in here, let's say, for example, air. And you're looking straight through it in here. So an object that is, so this is the normal to the two surfaces. An object that is sitting in here, minding its own business, light is reflected off of it and it's refracted in here. Okay, vice versa. If light goes from here, it's gonna be refracted in this way. So whichever way you look at it, this is the angle of refraction, a refraction, not reflection. And this is the angle of incidence. Incidence. They are related to one another, except their relationship depends on the medium. There is something called the index of refraction that depends on a refraction, not reflection, a refraction that depends on the medium. So for the this medium, let's say, for example, it's N, N2, and for this medium is N1. And the angle of incidence, I'm going to call it theta one, and the end is, uh, angle of reflect, uh, reflection is going to be refraction is going to be theta two. The law here says that this thing in here involves the sine of this one. In other words, n one times sine of theta one is equal to n two times sine of theta two, and that's how angles are refracted from one medium to the other. Okay. This is basically what you would have learned in uh, high school. The only thing that is probably different is n for air is equal to one, okay? And the same thing for vacuum. What this N refers to actually, the index of refraction is it refers to the, uh, is it to use in here? I don't know, vacuum. Is, uh, is uh, the ratio of, this, of the speed of light in the medium versus that in the air basically. So light in the medium travels with the speed V, which is not equal to the speed of light basically in the in the air. So this is basically how the speed in the in of light is in another medium because of the different interactions. And we're gonna get into this one into depth when we do optics, basically. And even when we do uh, some of you are sitting in physics for B, when we do for B also, we get into these ideas too that light as it travels from point to point is being absorbed actually the, by the material to so during the time when it's absor absorbed, it's not traveling anywhere. So between this atom and this atom, for example, light, so in here it travels with the speed C, but when it's absorbed, it's absorbed by the atom, then released. Once it's released, then it's going to travel with the speed C. So overall, you will see a net effect where light is actually traveling slower and slower and slower. As a matter of fact, the light is, if, if you have a very thick medium, in this case, light is not going to travel very far at all. So as a matter of fact, it's going to be absorbed. Case in point, the walls, for example, and around you, they are actually not uh, uh, transparent. For a glass, it is transparent because light can still go through it, albeit slower, but it still can go through it. And you can see the fish in the, in the bottom of the lake because, again, light can go through water, but there are some media like the wall, for example, where light actually has a very small depth in which it's going to penetrate. And then after that, it's going to die out because of these processes, okay? So that's stuff that we're gonna later know. For right now, for this lab, this is what you need to know if you didn't have this stuff in there. And again, we're gonna explore this one in far more depth down the road, okay? So this is basically what you need to know, that the index of refraction, and for air is one, is times sine of theta one is equal to N two times sine of theta two and you plug that into your lab in here and you should be fine, okay? So this is if you didn't have optics before for those who are watching the recording and they have had optics before in the past, they should not have problems with at least this 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 experiment, okay? So that's really the, uh, and if you do, that's basically the two ideas at this point that we're exploring. This is behavior is true, not just for light, true for all kinds of waves. Wave on a string, for example, can come in here. Let's say, for example, what we considered in the, in the lecture. So you have a wave in here. When it hits this, this fixed point, it's going to be reflected in such a way that the transmitted wave will be out of phase. Basically, it's going to come out in the opposite direction. So that is the reflection. 
And this is similar to the previous example that I was talking about in here on the mirror, because that's actually a reflection too. If you look closer in here, the ray that comes in, in here is actually the out of phase. It's going to flip the phase. And that's basically what we have. The polarity will be changed, okay? For the, for, the, for the electric field, because we're going to explore that one down the road in chapter 32 and learn that that's actually what's going on for light. But this is on a string. Now, if I take a different string and come up with two different strings, here is a, th a thick string, okay? And I attach it to a small thing, a string, and then I create a wave in here. Well, part of the wave is going to be reflected all the time, and even is true in here too. So even in the case of the surface of water, there will be some reflection, okay? But it's not big. Most of the Earth is going to be refracted. And in the, in the case of the flat mirror, it's the opposite. Okay, most of it is actually reflected, whereas some of it actually is still transmitted, okay, or absorbed by the surface in here, in this case, which is usually metal. Okay, so in this case, part of it is actually going to make the other medium, medium uh, uh, the wave in which is going to travel in here. So if it's traveling with the velocity V, this one will travel with a velocity V prime, a different velocity, because again, the density of the material is different than the density of this one. And we saw in lecture that this one is equal to square root of F over mu. And if mu changes between the two media, the velocity change again, similar to what's going on in light too, okay? So this, this phenomenon is true for all kinds of things. True for string, true for 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 uh, light, and it's true actually for sound. Sound and also sounds reflects off the surfaces and also can be transmitted also, and it can alter its, uh, its wavelength and so on and so forth. Okay, so the fact that we I gave you the example with the light and we're going to do this extensively in optics doesn't mean that it's not true for all kinds of waves. So this is basically the part of the lab in here that explores this idea. So you get, again, the incident wave, the reflected wave, and theta i is the angle of incidence. Theta r is the angle of reflection. In this case, Snell's law dictate that these two must be equal. You're going to explore this videos and come back to this one. Okay. Again, you really don't need to know a lot about this in terms of details as I explained them. If you watch these two videos, you're supposed to answer this question and you should be able to have no problem with it, okay? And then you're supposed to watch four more videos and answer question nine. The refraction is what I was talking about, and this is Snell's law, the one I was mentioning early, earlier, the index of refraction for the incident side times the sign of the incidence, the index of refraction from the refracted side times the sign of the refracted angle, not reflected now, or refraction, so this is the two media. You have Ni, you have Nr, and you have the wave now traveling with a velocity V1 and traveling with velocity two, V2. This angle is theta i, and this angle is theta r, okay? So that's basically the mathematics for it. You're supposed to watch the video and answer this question in it. There was actually a part of this lab that I removed because we're gonna do it later on to check the validity of this expression in here. So we're gonna do it later on, okay? when we do more in-depth analysis of wave uh, behavior. So again, we're going to watch these videos and answer this question. And again, in here, you have, oh man, did I forget to include this one in here? Actually, I forgot to include this one in here. So question 12, you're going to complete it after I upload, update this, this thing in here, OK? OK, let me do that since I just remembered this part in here. Not this file. You need a PDF file to continue this thing in here. So I'm going to upload that PDF file to answer question 12, okay? Let me grab the file quickly in here. So the worksheet, I'm going to come back to the lab instructions in here and make sure that we have that file uploaded for you guys. What is the... By the way, this very same lab we used to do it in class. 
and also we go through this very same exercise too okay so this is not different than what we used to do in a uh, lab so i'm gonna go to the end and enter so item two in here this is the worksheet you will need for question 12. And I'm going to upload the PDF file quickly in here. Upload document and grab the worksheet in here and put it in here for you. And I'm going to change slightly the name of this file, edit. And a refraction worksheet, that's what it's called, okay? And let me save before I, you guys refresh your screen. Save. If you refresh uh, lab two wave phenomena, you should see this file that you will need to do this part in there, okay? So you should be able to do the calculations for you. Actually, the worksheet, you really, for you, you really don't need that, uh, the, uh, the, the, the sign, because you can pull up a calculator and do it for yourself, okay? But if you really don't want to, you can follow the instructions on the worksheet. Worksheet, basically what it does, it gives you, uh, it gives you NI, which is air, it gives you sine theta for the angle of incidence, theta two R, and then you're supposed to find NR. So if you don't care to use the, Worksheet is fine, but you should be able to find the index of a refraction in this case. Okay, again, if you have difficulty with the lab or you don't understand something in here, please let me know so that we can go through it. Okay, again, now this is the diffraction, which is a different behavior that is going to be explored in depth in terms of optics again. So uh, you have a wave that comes in, in here, it goes with through a narrow opening in this case, and it exhibit, exhibits the phenomenon. Now, if the opening is very wide as compared to the wavelength, then it's going to just go through and you wouldn't notice the refraction. In other words, you take, for example, a big hole and you shine the light through it. In this case, it's going to go through from the other side. You don't see the edges. You see a perfect image basically of that hole on the other side. But if you make the hole smaller and smaller, so what happened to the light on the other side is going to spread. Okay, so take a box, a big, a big cardboard box, for example, and make a big hole in it and shine light from the other side. And you will see that the, the image is going to form on the other side, which is around similar to the shape that you made. If you make square, it's going to be a Im square image. But then if you make the shape smaller and smaller, what happened in this case, the image that forms on the other side was a, would be a little bit out of focus, actually it would be diffused on the, the there is, there is the, the, the light is going to start to form in this area. And that is because the wavelength is of the same order of the opening in this case. So this is the concept of diffraction in this case. Again, you're gonna explore it through the videos in here, and you're gonna find that this is basically the behavior that they, exp they, uh, they express for the case of water and so on and so forth. Okay, does the wavelength change that this distance change between crest and crest, okay? So that's what the question is exploring. How about the speed with which the wave? Again, this is just a description of what you see in the video. Okay. Interference is another phenomenon. I think I made a big fuss over it earlier when I was going through the GeoGebra activity. This is a different one though, where you're supposed to go there and explore how two waves combine, okay? And again, this is a 3D, uh, I mean, a uh, wave basically on a surface waves. So they have this behavior in here. This is again, when you have two sources, I tried to make the video for you guys on the surface water where this pattern is actually the interference pattern that forms for surface waves. Again, you're supposed to watch and answer all of these questions. Now, again, you're going to watch this one. And here you're talking about beats. And beats are specific 
a property of, 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 of waves, basically when the two, and again, we talked about it when we introduced waves, but this one explores that one. When the, the wave or the difference between the two frequencies is very close from one another, in this case, I will see that big hum, okay? So again, you're supposed to explore that with the difference of the two frequencies very close from one another. And this is another law that is a dispersion. Basically, if you have white light, most of these experiments up to this point were dealing with the same frequency, mainly what is called the monochromatic light, the same color, okay? But now if you have different colors or different uh, wavelength, different uh, frequencies, then in this case, what happened is they will, diffract, they, will, they, will, they will refract depending on their wavelength. In other words, the index of refraction depends on the frequency. And that's why you see rainbows, okay? Part of the question in here is, what do the letters R, O, Y, G, B, I, V mean? It's the colors of the spectrum. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. So that's basically what this is, okay? So that's how rainbows are formed because the water droplets in the air, basically they're suspended in the air, and now the rays that are white light coming from the sun, they go inside. So they are refracted once, once they go inside the droplets of water that is suspended in the air and they reflect back. So during the reflection, there is no problem, but during another refraction, the color split, okay? Once they split, you see all of that beautiful uh, rainbow that forms in the sky, okay? So again, this whole thing is exploring that idea, and that is because the index of refraction of water or any index of refraction, including that of the prism, uh, splits the frequencies in different, as a function of, uh, splits the rays as a function of, of, uh, of their frequency. I have two lasers in here, and I don't want to point them to you guys. Okay, this is the red one in here, but some reason it's not working right now, it is. Okay, so it's forming an image on my uh, red one. So this is a red color and it would diffract less than, because its wavelength is a lot longer than the green one, okay? So the green one has far more energy and should diffract more, okay? Here is how the colors are separated in this case, okay? It's a fun experiment. If we can do that, then uh, you're watching that and you're supposed to answer these questions again much more and about the how, the sound also, okay? That expresses also the... Uh... Now the Doppler effect is something that we're gonna explore in depth in chapter 16. So what's going on for the Doppler effect is you have a source of sound or a source of light or a source of a wave of some sort. And you have two observers, observer one and observer two. Observer one is in the path of the source. Source is moving this way, okay? And the observer two is away from it. It's moving away from it. So we say that the source is approaching O1, but receding from O2. Since it's approaching, the source sends a wavefront, moves, and then sends another wavefront. So the wavefronts appear compressed in here appear closer to one another. So the frequency that appears to that one looks higher because the wavelength is shorter and shorter. Remember V equals to lambda times the frequency. So if the frequency, if the, if the, if the lambda is getting less and less, that means the frequency is going higher and higher so that the velocity stays the same. That's why an ambulance or an emergency vehicle that is approaching from you, you can tell that it's coming there because of how the pitch, how the sound goes higher and higher toward higher and higher frequencies, so you can tell that it's coming toward you. If, on the other hand, the observer that the source is receding from it, in this case, you will see that the wavefront, because it sends a wavefront, moves and sends the next one. So in this case, the distance between the wavefronts is longer and longer. So again, because lambda is getting longer, the frequency has to go lower, in this case, to keep B equals to lambda F, okay? So in this case, the person will hear will hear a much uh, uh, lower pitch, okay, more depth, deep sound, okay, if you wish, okay, for sound. And it's true for all waves, okay. This is true for even for light, for a galaxy that is moving away from us. 
the colors, all of the colors will move toward the, the red. It doesn't mean that the galaxy would look red. Probably it's going to look red if it was in the visible, in the green, in the white light the region or the middle, because it's everything is shifted toward the red. So the red will be emphasized more. But a galaxy that is coming closer to it will appear blue okay, for the same reasons, because all the colors are shifted toward the blue. So this phenomenon is true also for light too. And that is how the red shift for the galaxies was discovered by Hubble. And that's how we learned that the universe is expanding because the faraway galaxies, all of them seem to be moving away from us. That's how we knew the universe is expanding, just by examining the shifting colors for different spectra. Okay. So again, we're going to get into this one in depth in this class. Okay. And all of this is just exploration of these ideas. Chapter 16, we'll go in depth into the calculation and get some numbers in here for you guys. In physics 4D, if you're ever going to take it, you will find that that value that we're going to find in chapter 16 is actually an approximation of the correct answer, which is more relativistic theory. Okay. If you ever take 4D, if you don't care to take 4D, you're not going to miss much because most of astronomy doesn't, or applications on a daily basis will be just happy with physics for uh, C. And as a matter of fact, the uh, this shift is easy. Now, this phenomenon actually is true also if the source is, the source is sitting still and the observer is moving now, okay? So the observer as, why is this in here? So there is nothing in here. It looks like there is a field to be filled in here. So I guess I need to fix that too, okay? Anyway, when the, the source is sitting still, it's minding its own business, sending the sound or sending the wave at constant rate. But for this one, it's coming to it so he's going to meet them because the relative velocity now is higher and higher. So he's going to meet them at a higher rate. So it seems to me, since I'm approaching the source, the source is sitting still, that the pitch again is higher because they're moving closer to them with higher and higher speeds. Okay. Whereas this one is receding from the source again, is going to have them spaced out. Okay. For the same reasons or at least they less and less of them because moving in the opposite direction. So by the time the next wave hits, the observer moves. So the next one will hit when the observer has moved even further and so on and so forth. So again, this will go toward a lower pitch, a lower frequencies, and this one will go toward higher pitch or higher frequencies and shorter wavelengths, higher frequencies, longer wavelengths, shorter, uh, uh, longer wavelengths, uh, lower uh, frequencies, and so on and so forth. So I guess you see the similarity in, in general, both of them could be happen. You could be traveling and an ambulance behind you or police officer behind you with a siren on, and you can distinguish if he or she is gaining speed on you or not, just by listening to the sound. You don't need to look back to see if the officer is leaving them behind, where the pitch is going less and less, or actually gaining more and more, and you can tell that, hey, better stop before uh, you get into trouble, okay? So that is basically, in general, both of them could be done. Basically, both A and B could be done. The source could be moving, and the observer could be moving, okay? So that is how this thing is. Again, you're supposed to watch the videos in here and answer the question, and you're supposed to hear the Doppler effect in here, and probably you already heard it. All you have to do is just stand out and see if the ambulance passes by and you can tell. I mean, you could be in your home, okay? And you can tell where the ambulance is going, if it's coming closer or leaving or moving away without having to look, okay? Again, for the Doppler effect, is it, po is it possible for light waves? And I already answered that for the <laughs> light waves. Yes, they exhibit that, okay? And resonance. Resonance is one of the critical phenomena that we're going to learn also. I know you did it in chapter 14 when you did the oscillations. So again, we're going to learn this one and it's basically supported oscillations. And that's a very important phenomenon, basically, where the amplitude, you have a driven phenomena now. Basically, the leaves on a tree, they're, they're const constantly being basically forced to oscillate. But that's an oscillation or a building, basically, sitting still and oscillated. But now the waves also can be in resonance, and that is actually what we will explore in this one too. Okay. Okay. Again, again, the tuning forks. That's something that I have, I think, some 
So again, please watch these videos and if you have difficulty understanding them or knowing, not knowing exactly what to answer, please let me know. Again, we're supposed, supposed, again, what you have in here, you have resonance, you have the tuning fork, for example, being struck at a certain frequency and another sound source meeting if they are in resonance, you're going to see amplified signal. If not, you're not going to see an amplified signal. And polarization is something I briefly mentioned, and probably for the case of light, sound doesn't exhibit polarization because it has no direction. Pressure is not, that is not a vector. But light, we will see later on, for those who are taking 4C, is actually the electromagnetic field is the one that exhibits this, this direction. Uh, electric field, that is specifically. So when you polarize a light, that means you, keep, you cancel all the electric field and keep only one direction. And when we do optics also, we're going to talk about polarization and see it from the experimental point of view. And that is why some of the glasses that have the polar, uh, polariza, polarizations, basically, tools on it, you can drive in the evening with no problems whatsoever. Again, this is an idea that hopefully you explore in here and you will see the difference between two images with and without, uh, basically, these proper filters that let, let the light move in one direction and not the other. Okay? Transverse wave easily, but of course, transverse waves, since we know which direction they are, if I want to keep them, I can put them only in that direction. But for even if they are not necessarily in one direction, even if they are po circular polarization, I can actually do it in such a way to keep only one direction and not the others. For uh, uh, sound waves, there is no polarization in this case. There is no, they are all in the same direction, so I cancel the wave or nothing at all. So that's why sound, you cannot polarize it. Why can water waves not be polarized? Again, I mentioned the fact is the, through the example of sound. We're going to go through the conclusion. I included a video in here of something that I did earlier. And uh, I think I'm going to upload this one again and probably send you a link. So if you're going to do it through PDF, it's going to be this nonsense 3D content has been disabled, enabled this feature. So it's a security thing on your uh, browser, on your uh, PDF reader. So for me, I trust this document because I'm the one actually who made it. So, okay, so let's do it now. So that is basically what I produced this interference pattern. So that's to help you understand this concept in here and everything else. Any questions about the lab? And how it's graded and all. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, I'm going to leave the, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. And if you guys want to work on it now, that's fine. If you want to work on it later, that's fine. You can leave and I will see you guys on Wednesday for the lecture course. Okay, so I'm going to stop the recording.